The following program is made possible by Prescott Tire Pros and Automotive Service. Bucky O'Neill, The Rough Riders, names that ring constantly in the history of this town. Who were these people? Why were they so important in our past? We're about to get the answers to these questions. Hi, I'm John Krizak, your host on the Prescott History Hour, and with me here today to answer those questions and several others, is my good friend, historian, and a colleague in the Prescott Corral of the Westerners, and a Rough Rider reenactor, Jay Eby. Jay, who was Bucky O'Neill? Bucky O'Neill was the editor of the Hoof and Horn when he was here in Prescott. He was also the probate judge at one time, a court recorder. He was the mayor of Prescott when he volunteered to go to Cuba and fight with the first United States volunteer cavalry, Roosevelt's Rough Riders. And who were the Rough Riders? The Rough Riders were, were created during the Spanish-American War, to serve in the Spanish-American War. And they were to come from the three, the four territories of the United States at the time, Arizona Territory, New Mexico Territory, Oklahoma, and Indian Territory. So this was an idea of Teddy Roosevelt, was it not? The, to recruit real horse riders from the West. Roosevelt had bragged years before that he could put together men from the territories from the West and train them for light cavalry within a month. And that idea got taken to the, the Congress and Congress authorized three regiments of mounted rifles for the Spanish-American War. So there was the Spanish-American War in 1898, and this opportunity came along, and Bucky O'Neill, who was the mayor of Prescott at the time, was one of the volunteers. Not only did he volunteer, he recruited, he the, recruited. the troops from Arizona, and the troops from Arizona gathered here in Prescott, got on the train, to go to San Antonio, Texas to train. Okay, we're going to talk about all those details a little bit later. And also the whole business of reenacting and celebrating the, uh, the Rough Riders. But tell me, who? what about this statue that we're standing in front of? The statue is dedicated to the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry and a memorial to Bucky O'Neill. The, the image is not of Bucky O'Neill, as many local uh, people believe. It, so it's, it's, it's not really the Bucky O'Neill statue, it's the, the memorial Riders. to the Rough Riders, and there's a whole story behind the creation of this memorial yes. that you've shared with me, and we will share with you as we Step back into the studio. Let's go there where we can really look at some photos and get into the details of this story. So this is Bucky O'Neill. Jay, tell us something about this 
notorious character in our history. William Owen O'Neill was born probably in St. Louis, although he said he was born in Ireland in 1860. By 79, he had written a letter to the governor, Governor Fremont, asking if there was opportunities in Arizona for a young lawyer. Well, but he went to school, basically grew up in Washington, D.C., did he, he not? His father was a, a Civil War veteran, wounded very seriously during the war, and he was he had different, his father had different jobs there in Washington. So Bucky grew up in Washington. So he went to school there and he may have studied some law at some point. Right. He was evidently uh, quite familiar with the law, yeah. if not a lawyer, as he said. So how did he get to Arizona? He wrote the governor. But uh, Governor Fremont, of course, wasn't in Arizona at the time. So John Gosper, the Secretary of State, answered his letter. And in 1879, evidently, O'Neill rode the train to New Mexico and then got on his burro and came all the way to Phoenix. And he got a job with a newspaper in Phoenix. He got a job with the newspaper. Uh, probably uh, McClintock's newspaper, although Gosper had a newspaper at the same time in Phoenix. And so he, he was in Phoenix a short time with one of the newspapers. So that's how we got to Arizona. Bucky was the kind of a guy who always went where the action was. Right on. And, and uh, very soon after he got to uh, uh, Phoenix, he wound up in, to, in Tombstone. That's where the action was. And he, he worked for the uh, Tombstone Epitaph. Right. And he was there in 1880 and 81. And in 1881 is when the shootout at the OK Corral happened. Right. We don't know, of course, if O'Neill was the reporter, but he was certainly where the action was. So after Tombstone, uh, when did he come to Prescott? He came back to Phoenix for a while, and he was in Major Vale's uh, Rangers, uh, a militia outfit. He also was uh, helped the Marshal of Phoenix at the time to settle down some of the ruffians. But he got to, to Prescott in 1882. 82, okay. So he would have been 21 by the time he got to Prescott. All right, uh, and what did he do when he got to Prescott? He established his hoof and horn newspaper where they advertised the brands for your cattle so that uh, Everyone knew your brands. He also was a, a member of the Prescott Grays and uh, was also helping uh, with, with the sheriff. He was involved in everything that was going on in Prescott. So the Prescott Grays were part of the militia? They were a militia unit, yes. Okay. But then he became sheriff? He was sheriff, he was elected sheriff in, in uh, 1890, and immediately upon his election, there was a, the dam broke at Walnut Grove uh, on the Hacienda, and the train was robbed at uh, Canyon, Diablo Canyon up by Flagstaff. So the, there's a story behind this train robbery, is there not? There is a great story behind O'Neill uh, organized his posse, took out after the bandits, uh, chased them all the way into the state of Utah, and uh, 
arrested them. There was a big gunfight, and but everybody got arrested. And O'Neill brought them back to uh, Prescott, all but one. One jumped off of the train on Raton Pass, and O'Neill jumped off, but he couldn't catch him. And so he only got three of them back to, to Prescott. But he captured the bad guys. He captured the bad guys, and when he applied for reimbursement for his expenses, the county wouldn't pay for his expenses that were not in Yavapai County. So his expenses through uh, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and back into Arizona were uh, not, not reimbursed. Not reimbursed, well, too bad. There's another story that you've told me about uh, when he was with the Grays. He was a witness at a hanging he was a witness at a hanging. Uh, a fellow by the name of Dilda uh, shot a deputy sheriff and uh, was captured, brought to Prescott to be hung. The Grays were the honor guard at the hanging. And this and was at this was in the plaza, right in downtown. It it was just east of the plaza. East, of, yes. okay. And they. When the trap door sprung and the body fell through, uh, Bucky O'Neill fainted. He fainted. He, he used the incident later in a story that he wrote about the uh, a horse of the hash knife brand. And he, this, the hero in that story faints at a hanging, so he used his own hanging, uh, his own fainting at that hanging as a as a part of his story. But he was involved in just about everything that went on in, in, in this town in that period, especially in the 1890s. Right. He was a, a, a judge of some kind. Uh, he, he was, uh, well, first of all, when he was the sheriff, he was also the county assessor. He collected the taxes. <laughs> And he had a big drive to collect the proper amount of tax from the railroads as they built their railroad through Arizona. He was, he was quite adamant about that. Since you mentioned railroads, there's another great story. Uh, uh, in, in 1892, the railroad had gotten here from Ash Fork, the, the main line up right. from uh, Ash Fork up here. But the railroad had not yet uh, gotten through to Phoenix. Right. And there were many efforts to build a, or to create a, a stagecoach line right. between here and Phoenix. And there's a great story uh, 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 from the Territorial Times. This is written by a Leland Hanchett, staging on the Black Canyon Road. And it says that this was a story that began early on a cold, snowy winter's morning in Prescott in 1892. And the passengers on this stage were Will Barnes, Price Behan, who was an old buddy of Bucky's, Bucky O'Neill, a young commercial traveler, and two sisters of charity dressed in their distinctive garb. Five or six miles into the trip, the team started off down a steep grade at a fast trot when the coach was swaying and rocking like a ship in a heavy sea. And a few, within a few moments, those inside were convinced that the driver was drunk and could not control his team. They were probably out about around Costco at this point. <laughs> the men decided on a plan of action. Behan and O'Neill overpowered the driver and Behan took over the reins. Handcuffs were snapped onto the driver's wrists. How come there were handcuffs on that stage? Probably because Bucky had them. Probably because Bucky had them. So anyway, the, the team was stopped. Uh, they threw the drunken driver into the big leather boot at the back of the stage. 
Uh, and at noon, they reached Big Bug, the regular mail station, where the driver was handed over for transport back to Prescott as a prisoner. There was no other driver available, so Behan agreed to drive the team on to Gillette, some 35 miles to the south. Rain was falling in torrents, and the Agua Fria must be crossed to reach the stage station on the southern side. Now, this is somewhere in the vicinity of the Rock Springs Cafe, right, uh, right off of the 17. I think Gillette was a mining uh, community a couple miles south of there. But nearly midnight, the stage rolled out of the Black Canyon onto the gravelly bank of the Agua Fria. The stage stopped a few uh, yards from the water's edge, and so they could see the lights of the station, uh, but this boiling, turbulent river was between them and the lights. The four men studied the situation. They were willing to cross, but what are the two sisters? The two women were huddled together in the dark vehicle, shivering with cold, where O'Neill told them of the situation, and they decided to... It was worth the risk, and they trusted these guys. So the elder of the two women said, you decide, we'll leave it up to you and in the hands of our Heavenly Father. So they started across, and they agreed. Behan would drive, and O'Neill uh, filled a bucket with stones so he could throw them at the, at the, at the mules to keep them going. So the two other men, each with a sister of charity on his side, were to stand on the upstream side of the vehicle. So they're holding tightly to the rail on top. They were to lean as far back as possible to act as a counterbalance against the tremendous pressure of the stream against the side of the stage. Behan loosened the brake and they started across. O'Neill is pelting the animals with rocks to try to keep them going lashing him with his whip. As the gallant little leaders struck deep water and began to swim, they were swept around with the current and downstream. The longer-legged wheelers, I guess they put the longer-legged mules closer to the coach, right. and the, that's the way they did it. Uh, and they were uh, forced to swim. And finally, the huge stage floated free the water was up to the knees of the four clinging to the side. Each was leaning back just as far as their arms were allowed to keep the stage from overturning, while Behan did his best to keep the team headed towards the farther bank. As the stage swung around in the stream, the wheels on the lower side struck a rock, and they thought for a couple of agonizing moments as if they'd be turned over in the water and all would be lost. And just at that critical moment, the two little lead mules touched bottom and with the points of their feet clawed and tore at the steep bank. Gradually, they got the stage to move ahead. The long-legged wheelers also touched bottom and they clawed and dug as they realized the need of using every ounce of power available. Inch by inch, second by second, the heavy stage began to move through the water towards the bank and gradually, they, on an even keel, uh, the going was steep, and it took the last rock in O'Neill's water bucket, plus Mitch yelling and slashing of the whip, to get the whole outfit safely onto the solid land. And minutes later, they drove the stage uh, through the cottonwoods to the station. And it's kind of hard to believe today, 140 years after that uh, construction, <laughs> the Black Canyon Road has become Interstate 17, 17. basically, and no longer uh, is it necessary to ford streams like that. But that's another story involving Bucky, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, okay, so Bucky, while he was in Prescott, got interested in mining. Right. So he had a mine somewhere out near Mayer. Yes, at least one of his uh, interests was in a, a mine, uh, an onyx mine down by Mayer. 
And that's a, a very important thing in, in his story because I think the sale of that uh, allowed him then to go and promote the railroad to his claims that were up by the Grand Canyon. He was, he was interested in getting the financing available to put a smelter at Williams, Arizona and take the railroad from Williams to the Grand Canyon toward his claims that were there. So he was interested, that was copper mining, was it not? Copper. Up around Williams, actually at the Grand Canyon. Right, at the Grand Canyon. But the smelter was to be at Williams. A smelter to be in Williams. Uh, so he built a cabin up there. He built a cabin at the Grand Canyon. And you can still rent his cabin for the night uh, at the rim of the Grand Canyon on the, on the south rim. Yeah, and it's, it's today part of the Bright Angel Lodge yes. on the south rim of the canyon. And there's a picture here of him uh, supposedly in his cabin, but it may have been in a tent before the cabin was, was built. Was finished, yes. Uh, but there's Bucky, the tireless promoter, the tireless writer. Writer, yes, he was, he was writing articles for newspapers in, primarily in California. Uh, he, had, he had, wrote stories, uh, he wrote uh, pamphlets that advertised Arizona as a place to uh, find your fortune, uh, secure your health, and uh, retire happily. Happily, yes. <laughs> so, how did he get this nickname of Bucky? Because that wasn't his given name. No, William Owen O'Neill, but he was evidently a very successful gambler. His favorite game evidently was the game of Pharaoh and there you can bet on rather sure re outcomes or you can bet on very uh, high odds. And uh, So he was, a, he was a frequent guy hanging out on Whiskey Row during the Whiskey 1890s. Row. And Pharaoh was the game of choice. Of choice. Uh, and when you bet on the bad odds, they call it bucking the tiger. And so he was bucking the tiger, evidently, very regularly, and he got the name Bucky from that. And he obviously liked that because he used it. Uh, the, rest the, the rest of his life. The rest of his life. The rest of his life. Well, that's interesting how Bucky O'Neill got the name Bucky O'Neill. We're going to take a break here. I'm John Krizak, host of the Prescott History Hour, and with me is Jay Eby, a historian uh, and a good friend in the Westerners. And uh, we'll be back in a minute because there's a lot more to tell about Bucky and what happened to him that led to the statue in the square. This program is made possible by Prescott Tire Pros and Automotive Service. Located out on Iron Springs Road, this is a full service tire and automotive repair and maintenance business. They've been in business in Prescott for over 20 years and have 14 full-time people on staff, including two master certified technicians who are constantly getting recertified. And they take great pride in their work. They also take pride in supporting many local charitable causes, including a unique program of donating recycled vehicles to people in need and wheelchairs to deserving veterans, and in their participation 
in our annual Prescott Parades. Prescott Tire Pros is one of the founding members of a national network of over 700 Tire Pro dealers throughout the U.S. So service is available just about anywhere you might go. Owner Louis Gomez and his wife Angel are proud to call Prescott Tire Pros an underwriter of the Prescott Media Center, making programs like the Prescott History Hour possible. Welcome back to the Prescott History Hour. We're in the studios here at Channel 64. And I'm John Krizek, the host of the Prescott History Hour. And with me is Jay Eby, our expert on Bucky O'Neill and the uh, period of time that he represents in our history. And b by the way, this picture behind me on the wall is a picture of the intersection of Gurley and Montezuma, which was probably taken about 1905. Uh, now, we were talking about all of the things that uh, Bucky Owen did for this community in the 1890s. Did he ever get married and have a family? Yes. Bucky O'Neill married Pauline Schindler. She was the daughter of the captain at Fort Whipple. So again, we're involved with the military. Yeah. <laughs> and Bucky O'Neill. He was elected also uh, as probate judge. And as probate judge, he was also then, uh, as, as it was in those days, the, separate, the superintendent of schools for Yavapai County. So he's involved in the education process as well as law enforcement and, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and all. Uh, Bucky and Pauline uh, had a son who died in infancy. Uh, they also adopted another son and they had their, their house on Sheldon Street about where the Waffle Iron. Yes, they are the is. house on uh, Sheldon, uh, and there is a uh, historic marker today on Sheldon in front of the Waffle Iron restaurant, which we all drive by uh, and never take the time to look at. But there it is, and that's where Bucky lived when he was doing all these uh, wonderful things in, in Prescott. And then came 1898. 1898, Bucky this, yeah. was elected mayor of Prescott. Okay. And the war with Spain was in the offing. Yes, the Spanish-American War of 1898. And that really changed things. Now, just as a historical footnote, uh, there was a lot of uh, hysteria in the country at that time about the Spanish occupation of Cuba. Uh, and there were revolts going on, popular revolts against Spanish rule in Cuba. And uh, our government sent the battleship Maine down Pres to Havana. President McKinley ordered the main to Havana Harbor, uh, a show of, of force and support for those folk, uh, Americans that were in, yeah. in Cuba at the time. And then when the main got blown up, that really pulled the trigger 
and got us involved in the Spanish-American right. War. We objected to, to the Spanish government about the, their treatment of the Cuban people, and Spain finally declared war against the United States, and of course, Congress authorized the president to declare war, and McKinley uh, and Congress uh, authorized three regiments of mounted rifles to be recruited in the West. Now, there was a certain sense of urgency and timing. I mean, they, there was a, a need for getting our armed forces, forces geared up for this in a hurry. Right. And to come, our, our forces came from 26,000 up to 200,000 within a month, and the logistics of that happening are, are tremendous. Now, I understand that Teddy Roosevelt, at the time, was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Yes. And he had been bragging about how he could take uh, Western volunteers, right. people from the West, who knew how, when they were going to establish this cavalry, right. he could uh, take Western volunteers who knew how to ride, they knew how to shoot, they knew how to camp, and he could train them for this military service in a month. Right. So then what happened? Well, the Arizona boys, uh, uh, Major Brody for one, uh, offered a full regiment of mounted rifles to from Arizona territory. But uh, the recruits from Arizona were to join the first United States Volunteer Cavalry. And the, those fel folks were to come from the territories, which is Arizona Territory, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Indian Territory. So our, we, we were to raise 200 uh, men to go and, and fight as part of, of that unit. Roosevelt was offered the colonel's position with that, and he said that he was not, uh, did not have enough military background to do that by himself. And, but his friend Leonard Wood could do that. Leonard Wood, at the time, uh, was the surgeon for the president in Washington, and Leonard Wood took the colonel's position, and Roosevelt took the uh, second position under, under the colonel. So that's how Teddy Roosevelt's name got attached to this, but Bucky was our mayor, right. and he led the effort to recruit Throughout these the volunteers, right? And he, he assigned uh, coordinators in each of the counties. The counties uh, supplied their share of the uh, men to go. They all came to Prescott, got on the train at Fort Whipple, and then got on the train to go to San Antonio, Texas, to train. Okay, so Bucky was key to. Uh, recruiting these volunteers, Absolutely. about 160 of them from Arizona, and they went to uh, San Antonio. Right. And there's a picture here of all of the uh, officers. Officers. Uh, uh, and Teddy Roosevelt is sitting in the front. Absolutely. And, and who are the other principals on each side of them? There's Leonard Wood. Le Leonard Wood. And each of the officers had to provide their own uniforms. And Roosevelt knew that the army was going to change to the khakis from the blue wool. And so he had his and Leonard Wood's uh, uniforms made by Brooks Brothers, of yeah. course. You're gonna explain that just a little later, but Bucky is in this picture in the third row as one of the officers in this uh, whole contingent including the Arizona 
the Arizona boys are, yeah. are there. By the way, you may have noticed the mascot sitting on the ground there on a leash. It was a mountain lion cub sent with the soldiers by Robert Brow, the owner of the Palace Saloon. Her name was Josephine. She didn't make it to Cuba, but she did make it back to Prescott with Major Brody. Bucky and his group, uh, Major Brody leading that group, uh, arrived in San Antonio first, uh, the first troops to get to camp, and uh, they got assigned as, tro as Troop A, Troop B, and Troop C. So the Arizona boys were the, the, the first to get all of their equipment, the first to get their they horses. They were Troop A. They were Troop A. And they got their horses there. Right. And then they went to Tampa, Florida. All the way on the train with all of their equipment and their horses to Tampa, And Florida. there's this classic picture of Bucky on a horse in Tampa. Tampa. Now, as I understand it, then, even though they're cavalry with horses, they could not get their horses on the boat to actually go to Cuba. They had to leave their horses, their saddles, their sidearms, and all at, in Tampa, along with many of the troops, to take care of the, the horses. So then they went, uh, and now what, what time of year was this? This was? This was May. This is all happening in the spring of 1898. Right. And it happened quickly. And right. they, so they got to uh, Cuba, and They're, they'd only been, it had only been a, a, a little over a month after they left Prescott. Right. Roosevelt, and by the way, Roosevelt's Rough Riders is a, a name that the media of the time Assigned, they like to have Roosevelt's name in their headlines. So even though Leonard Wood was the colonel, Roosevelt's name got attached to these fellows from the West. They got on the boats, went to Daiquiri on the southern coast of Cuba, landed. The Spanish troops did not oppose the landing, which was very fortunate because. It was a helter-skelter uh, thing to get, uh, to get ashore. There's another story you told me about Bucky while they were landing in Cuba. Yeah, they, they were up against the, the waves, banging the boats against the, the wharf there in, in uh, Dockery. And one of the black soldiers from the 10th Cavalry trying to get onto the, the wharf, fell overboard, and Bucky immediately dove in to try to save him. He was not successful, but he, he was willing to try. Again, that's O'Neill out front taking their risk and, and uh, where the action really well, is. There's another indication of the character of the man. Right. So they got ashore. There were a couple of battles there was a battle at a place called Las Guasimas, uh, and then they all lined up in front of the uh, defenses at Santiago, uh, and this, they, they were, the Spanish were entrenched at the top of San Juan Hill. And then what happened, Bucky was playing the role of a of a brave officer. Of a brave officer. And, and the, in the time, the officers uh, were to stand up to uh, keep their troops down, in this, in this case, keep the troops down into a, a road embankment. Uh, and, but O'Neill, like the other officers, was parading up and down to show that there really was no fear uh, of being shot. But he got a, shot. A Spanish sharpshooter shot him, and Bucky was killed before before the troops went up San Juan. Before Hill. they actually conquered the hill, but his leadership had made an impact. Absolutely. 
there's another picture of Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders on San Juan Hill yep. in victory, but Bucky's not there. No. Uh, out of all of the soldiers, the ones from Arizona, how many were wounded or killed? There was a lot of a lot of them were, were wounded. A great number of of uh, Major Brody was wounded. Uh, Mo many of the of our troops were wounded. The, there were only four of the Arizona boys that were killed. Out of that contingent of right. 160 or so. Well, it was a critical moment in our history and our town's contribution. And Bucky, it turned out, uh, was buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Yes, the, his, his grave is in Arlington, very near his father's grave, and very near the foremast for the battleship Maine. As the years went by after that, there was this campaign to acknowledge the role of the Rough Riders and Bucky in that campaign. Right. And can you say a little about the campaign that went on to raise the money to provide the monument? The idea was to put a monument on the plaza in Prescott, uh, honoring Bucky O'Neill and the Rough Riders. Money was gathered from many sources. Uh, a committee, of course, was appointed to uh, handle the transactions, and a fellow named Morrison was assigned to go to New York to try to get a statue in our, on our plaza uh, honoring O'Neill and the Rough Riders. Well, now, Morrison went, as you told me, he went to New York, and he only had five or ten thousand dollars right. collected and this was uh, in the early 1900s and he found the sculptor uh, Borgum Borglum Borglum who was a renowned famous sculptor at the time right his brother did the the sculpting on the the, the monument now, in Mount Rushmore. Mount, Mount Rushmore. Rushmore. Well, and there's an exhibit about Borgum in the Fippen Museum here in right. town also. Anyway, so as the story goes, he met this famous sculptor. He didn't have anywhere near enough money, right. but he presented the request, and Borgum said, yes, you will have you, your... You shall have your... Monument. You shall have your monument. And that got us to 1907, where the sculpture was unveiled at the plaza here. In, mounted on a boulder. Mounted on a boulder. <laughs> but there's uh, this great shot. It was July the 4th, I think. 1907, right. when the monument was unveiled in the plaza to perpetuate the memory of Bucky and the Rough Riders. And that's the statue that we all admire today and that makes us so proud to be part of this community. So I think what we need to do is celebrate the reenactment that you and your fellows put on to honor this memory. Let's go back out to the statue and uh, hear a little bit more about how we remember this part of our history. Okay. 
We're back here at the plaza in downtown Prescott in front of the memorial statue to the Rough Riders. And with Jay and I here is Dave Williamson. These guys are among the reenactors who celebrate the uh, Rough Riders in our Fourth of July parade and other parades. And they're going to tell us a little bit about what these guys do. Jay, do you want to describe the uniforms that you guys are wearing and why? What do they represent? The uniforms that were issued to the Rough Riders are very different than some of the pictures that you see uh, about, even in the films, about the Rough Riders. I wear the uniform of a captain of cavalry. That's what it says on my collar, the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, which was the official name for the Rough Riders. But the media of the day wanted Roosevelt's name in their headline, and so they created Roosevelt's Rough Riders. My uniform is blue wool. Many of the officers wore this type of uniform. Bucky O'Neill wore this type of uniform when he went to fight in Cuba. It was the last time that the United States Army went to war in blue wool. The troopers uniform David has on here. Wait a minute, they're wearing blue wool Whoa. and they're going to Cuba? They're going to Cuba in June. <laughs> okay. Yes, they, right. they did. All right, and what's but Dave wearing? Dave is wearing the uniform issued to the troopers of the day. Most of the rest of the army was still in blue wool, but the Rough Riders, the troopers got issued the uniform, the stable uniform, or the dungarees of the time, and they had the nice blue wool shirt along with the khaki jacket. And Dave can tell you about his arms that he's that the Rough Riders carried. Well, <clears throat> standard arm for the Rough Riders was the Krag rifle. So it's 30 caliber, uh, the first bolt action rifle, magazine fed rifle that the U.S. Army adopted. Kind of interesting is Norwegian in design, and uh, they picked it because the action was so smooth. It's one of the first rifles that loaded from the side. So you'd be able to put the rounds in here, and then they had a switch that they could throw that would uh, allow the rounds to either come from the magazine or to be inserted in the bolt. So uh, kind of an interesting first for the U.S. Army in that it was the first smokeless powder rifle as well. Up until then, the Army had been using 4570s and stuff that Custer was doing in uh, using in the Indian Wars. And a lot of the troops did go to the Spanish-American War to Cuba with those 4570s. But the Rough Riders, through Roosevelt's connections, were uh, able to get the Crags, which was an up-and-coming rifle, although they didn't last very long. It gave way to the 1903s, uh, right after the turn of the century. So one of the other things they had was uh, single-action army pistols. So the single-action pistols weren't exactly army regs, but they were, uh, you know, it's a cowboy without his uh, six-shooter. So a lot of them took them anyway and uh, used them in the, the battle. Um, although some, they also had 38s and stuff too. Yeah. Some of the rough, some of the officers were brought their sabers, but the saber was not issued to the troopers uh, of the. Roosevelt's Rough Riders because it takes a great deal of time to train to use the saber and so they they were not issued sabers. Well this whole thing happened rather quickly didn't it? Well yes they brought their the army from 26,000 to 200,000 within a month. Within a month? Within a month. Was this the spring of 1898? 1898. The troopers from Arizona left Prescott. They gathered here on the plaza. They had announcements and uh, speeches by the governor, the territorial governor. 
the, they were given a flag to take with them. Evidently, you couldn't go to, to Walmart and buy an American flag at the time. But it had only 45 stars on it. The men from Prescott, particularly Mr. O'Neill, Bucky wanted his star, the star for Arizona, on that flag. They wanted to be a state. Yeah, the idea of Arizona territory becoming a state was percolating at that time. Absolutely. So. The governor of the territory, of course, was appointed by the president of the United States, not elected by the people. The people here wanted to be a state. So they gathered here. You know, one of the stories that we've heard is how the Rough Riders uh, gathered and there were 40 some saloons or watering holes between here and the train station. And they hit them all along the way. That's a story. That's a story. And that's, uh, they did gather here on the plaza, marched to the train station and got on the train and went to San Antonio, Texas to train. Okay. But they may have uh, hit a few watering holes on the way to the train station. While they were gathering and, and staying at uh, Whipple Barracks. And did they take their horses with them? No. They did not. By the time, when they got to, to Tampa, Florida, to get on the boats to go to Cuba, there were not enough boats to take the, all of the troops or their horses. And so all of the cavalry that went left their horses and part of their regiment in Tampa and got on the boats and went to fight in Cuba afoot. Afoot. But when they left here, did they leave with their horses? No. They the did horses not. horses were, were issued well, while they were, while they were in, in San Antonio. In Texas. Yes. Okay. Well, now, some years ago, you told me that there was a movie made about the Rough Riders. And you guys actually went to Florida as part of that movie. Can you tell us yes. about that? Well, yes. NFL Films was making a movie about the Spanish-American War. Not specifically about the Rough Riders, but about the Spanish-American War. But part of their scenes included the soldiers that went up the hill uh, in Cuba to set the Cuban people free from the King of Spain. And so they asked us to go with them to Florida, to Tampa, and make the film that they were making for the History Channel. So that was in 2004 when you guys were in Florida helping to make that film about the Spanish-American War. Great. We're really fortunate to have in Prescott the Rough Rider reenactors, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys in the next parade. And thank you for all you do in celebrating the Rough Riders and the role of this community in the Spanish-American War. Thank you very much.